National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby dug his heels in when asked if the White House would support a ceasefire between Russia and Ukraine. Here's what he told CNN's Caitlin Collins yesterday. But as you know, we've, we've been very, very uh, public about any concerns uh, about some sort of a ceasefire announcement right now. We all want to see peace. We all want to see this war end. It could end today if Mr. Putin did the right thing. But a ceasefire called right now would basically just ratify Russia's conquest and give Mr. Putin more time to re-equip and uh, retrain and, uh, and restart operations at a time and a place of his choosing. Now, when asked how Ukraine would likely respond if the offer of a ceasefire were put on the table, Kirby gave this response. Yes, we do, and we would uh, reject it as well. We think that that's an unacceptable outcome right now. Uh, obviously, we want the fighting to stop. We want the war to be over. And as I said, it could end today if Mr. Putin would do the right thing. But to call for a ceasefire right now basically ratifies what they've been able to grab inside Ukraine and gives them time and space uh, to prepare for future operations, and that's just not going to be accepted. This doesn't make any sense to me. It, it also gives the Ukrainians time. A ceasefire, I, in theory, yes, gives the Russians time to, I guess, enlist more troops or get more supplies or whatever. It also gives the Ukrainians time to do that. It gives them time to stop being killed en masse. Right. So I, I think this— A ceasefire, they say they want peace. We could have a ceasefire and that would be peaceful. Th this argument is premised on the idea that the— only acceptable solution to this conflict from a Western and Ukrainian perspective is complete territorial retreatment by Russia to establish the borders that existed prior to their right. invading Ukraine. And I understand why Ukraine is obviously very invested in that outcome, and less well why America is quite as invested in the outcome, except for our allyship with Ukraine, generally speaking. But I at a certain point, I don't know if that reflects any reality. So the, the argument that Kirby is making is that if we call a ceasefire now while Russia is occupying Ukrainian territory, it basically cements their encroachments and makes them permanent in some way mm -hmm. and gives them the ability to basically set up camp. And those are now the new lines why we negotiate the ceasefire. And that is a concession that Ukraine shouldn't be making at this time. Now, what's so interesting is that Absent a conversation, and there has never been from the beginning of this conflict any meaningful conversation about what it would mean to deal with the fact that Ukraine is a country that was involved in a civil war for years because of the mixed feelings of the people within its own borders about its belonging to right. Russia versus Ukraine. Russian speakers in the East have had their rights undermined both before and during this conflict, Russia being stripped from a kind of a national language status. I saw a CNN clip, or maybe it was MSNBC, I don't remember which, but a clip that was champion. It was a story championing uh, Ukrainian citizens who were turning in their novels written in literature uh, to bookstores, um, big piles of Russian books that people were giving up, not not being burned, but it was the imagery was very evocative, and this was being championed as a kind of sense of national pride to turn in your pushkin as though these are just not authors that have long traditional yeah, and history in both countries. I don't know. It, it's a very interesting posture. And it is one that, frankly, has been reflected yeah. across the aisle. I think this this position is is wrong. It is a it is a pro war. It is a position for continued violence and continued fighting. If you are saying there can be no that we can't let the Ukraine, we can't have the Ukrainians and the Russians stop shooting each other, stop killing each other un until I, what they're saying implicitly is until all the Russian forces withdraw from Ukraine, then yes. then it's then there's going to be a lot more shooting and a lot more killing. Yes. And you could have no, you should agree to a ceasefire as soon as one is offered. And then there can be negotiation about the futures of those territories. Yes, it is. It is very it is not particularly likely that. Ukraine holds on to all of its territory and all of it is governed by the Zelensky administration as an outcome of this war. Unfortunately, I wish it were the case, yeah. but reality is reality. Maybe those regions could be neutral and could have their own elections or decide if they want to be part of Russia. Wow. Wait, what are you talking about, a Minsk agreement? <laughs> <laughs> who who could have thought something like that? How wild. Let's have a ceasefire. And then we can have negotiation and we can see what comes of it. Yeah. And if something unsatisfactory comes of it, okay, go back to shooting and killing each other if that's ever what 
really what everybody wants to do. But the idea that we can't have an end to the violence until Ukraine gets everything it wants means this will go on forever. Right, and especially because Ukraine doesn't have the independent capacity to beat Russia in a war. So the no. implication is, again, this continued proxy war that has pretty high stakes. To the last we man. have two nuclear powers. Now, despite there being quite a bit of pushback and anti-war movement on the right, the blob itself seems to be very much on board uh, and very much nonpartisan. Fox News senior strategic analyst, General Jack Keane, says everyone in the international community can see through China's peace brokering position. Let's take a listen. Promoting peace. Everybody in the international communities, you know, sees through this. Stop. He's proposing to stop all the sanctions now and immediately go to a ceasefire, which certainly uh, enshrines Russia's conquest of the additional space in, in Ukraine and puts them in a better position to reset and reattack uh, later. I mean, in, in terms of what is happening here strategically, and I'm not convinced that our foreign policy and national security community has really adjusted to this strategic calculus. And U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken said the international community should reject any tactical move by Russia to call for a ceasefire in Ukraine that is backed by China. He said, quote, the world should not be fooled by any tactical move by Russia supported by China or any other country to freeze the war on its own terms. So a lot of this does seem to be uh, kind of bristling at the idea that China is occupying the U.S.'s historical role as brokering peace bringing democracy, all of the kind of things that America heralds for itself. But a uh, frequent guest of the show, Trita Parsi, wrote in a recent piece over at, Responsible, at, the, at the Quincy Institute that China actually has been taking a more moderate position than you might think on Ukraine and Russia based on U.S. reporting, and that it has been very clear about its respect for territorial borders and sovereignty, but is being feeling a lot of pressure, given the escalated rhetoric from the United States, not to divorce itself from its relationship with Russia. If the United States is going to take an adversarial posture, this is the argument, if the United States is going to take an adversarial posture to China that's so open, it's in China's best interest to maintain positive, even in a closer relationship and more positive um, relations with Russia, even if it objects to Russia's actions in Ukraine. Well, and a more neutral party could put an, is, is going to be in a better position to bring an end to this conflict, which is what we should ultimately want. We should care more about the conflict ending, yes, not with the conquest of Ukraine by Russia, with independence for the, the Ukrainian, uh, uh, the, the, the areas of Ukraine that want to remain Ukrainian. That's what we should be trying to bring about. And I don't think the administration's position that we will support Ukraine till the end of time, no matter what it takes, support Ukraine being support Zelensky, support the current administration's position, a, a, a war-footed position forever. That doesn't serve the interests of peace. Does it even serve U.S. interests? It's not. It's not clear to me that that serves U.S. interests. A, yeah. You know, continuing to to drain our own resources in a fight over the uh, the eastern border of Ukraine. Yeah. If if the argument is that a ceasefire now concretizes Russia's position in Ukraine. I would like to hear an articulation of what the plan is, what the timeline is, what the resource investment would would what the resource investment would be for Ukraine to fully push Russia out mm -hmm. of all of the occupied territory. And I I think that kind of clarity might help people decide whether or not it's kind of worth the cost from an American perspective. Certainly, U Ukraine's interests are different than our own our own here. Right. But there's something that seems ra rather dishonest about framing it as a decision, decision between Ukraine winning the war with no sacrifice, no lives lost, and no overwhelming American investment, and no risk of World War III, or ceding ground to Russia and allowing um, a, a sovereign t a nation to be invaded. Yeah, the national security state, the blob, as you called it, as yeah. many people call it, it just doesn't seem very realistic to me. And this is not the first time. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the 20th anniversary of the Iraq War. Yeah. So, uh, you know, remember these kinds of things and how they, and how, what, what all of the military experts said, what every, the political experts, every, the, many in the media, everyone, was, yes, it has to be done, can't be done any other way. That yeah. has changed 20 years later. Absolutely. The popular view of the necessity of that war. More rising right after this.